On behalf of the Fulbright Associa Association, welcome to the, I believe it's our 18th um, Fulbright Prize event. Today we come together as a very strong representation of the Fulbright community. I can see around here State Department officials, I can see members of Congress, I can see many, many of the executive directors of commissions here. I believe at the conference we will have almost two dozen, and I really appreciate your all coming. We also have academic officers from our two sponsoring, co-sponsoring institutions, the University of Arkansas and George Washington University. Thank you very much. I'd also like to welcome the, well, first of all, I'd like to say, Senator Luger, you are our special guest today. Thank you very much for being here. This is a special occasion. I believe you have some guests in the audience today, and I'd say welcome to those guests, and also to the members of the International Selec Selection Commission, uh, Richard Arndt, chair, is with us on the stage today. Manfred Phillip is sitting just down here on the first row. He is chair designate for the 2018 prize. Uh, Richard Arndt is the chair for this year's prize. Penny Egan is here from the UK, uh, director of the Fulbright Commission there. Thank you to all of you. Also, I'd like to recognize our speakers today, and they're with us on stage. Mala Adiga from the Department of State. Joaquin, <laughs> Congressman Joaquin Castro. Richard Art, and of course, Senator Luger. Thank you all. I'd like to speak to you for a moment about the prize and what the prize is all about. As many of you may know, the Fulbright Association was formed in 1977 to serve the growing base of alumni in the United States, I believe at the request of Senator Fulbright. We now have 49 chapters across the country, and I can tell you they're growing in strength. The, some, there are some of our chapters in larger cities today who are as strong as the association was five or 10 years ago. So it's wonderful to see that growth and the alumni representation of the Fulbright program. The life stories, by the way, I've noticed of our alumni follow a pretty common arc. We have our awards, we have that amazing experience, we, start our careers at that time, and that works itself in and out of our careers, that interest in international relations. And then finally we come back to the end of our careers, and many times we come back to the Fulbright community and become volunteers there. And that's where I find myself now, and I'm finding a lot of people doing a similar arc We give back in these ways because we are grateful for the opportunity the Fulbright Award gave to us. And we all have that dedication to understand the world better and our place in it as a result of our Fulbright experience. Last year, Andrew Young spoke at our conference in Atlanta, and he surprised me he made a link between Fulbrighters and the civil rights leaders. He said, the orderly vision of a stable planet that includes bringing us together with our enemies was the vision of Mahatma Gandhi in India, Nelson Mandela in South Africa, and Martin Luther King across the American South. 
He added, we, we managed to learn, as Martin Luther King says, to live together as brothers and sisters rather than perish together as fools. But he added, we have a long way to go. And then he said, as he turned to direct, directly to address Fulbrighters, people who have the kind of global experiences you have are the natural leaders. More and more in the Fulbright Association, we're trying to meet that challenge and we'll need your help in doing that. This prize event is a great way for us to renew that commitment. The prize recognizes outstanding contributions toward bringing peoples, cultures, or nations together to a greater understanding of others. The first prize was presented in 1992 to former South African President Nelson Mandela. In the 17 years since, we've awarded the prize to outstanding individuals, one foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates, and one NGO, Doctors Without Borders. Our recipients are varied. Doctors and healthcare leaders, a former head of the International Atomic Energy Commission, civil rights leaders, and political leaders. But they share an extraordinary commitment to better the world. And that's why we're all here today. Our first speaker today is Richard Arndt. We couldn't have a more appropriate speaker for the prize ceremony than if you'll let me call him Dick Arndt. The prize exists to remind us of the importance of educational exchange also known as cultural diplomacy. And Dick literally wrote the book on cultural diplomacy. It's called, as you may know, The First Resort of Kings, American Cultural Diplomacy in the 20th Century. Richard Arndt. Can you hear me all right? Uh, I think the important thing for me to do today is tell you a little bit about the prize because the selection of the prize is what makes it. It has been a very, very distinguished prize. When you come count the leaders like Nelson Mandela, Desmond Tutu, Bill Gates, Bill Clinton, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Carter, uh, Marilyn Robinson, all kinds of people have gotten this prize and it's been, we can be very, very proud of it. But it started in 1987 we began talking about it in the board. Uh, I was in the government until 1986. I joined the board about that time, and we began to th talk about a prize that would make the, the ideals of Fulbright come alive in various people. Well, we had two uh, quite remarkable people on the board at that time. Last, uh, the first was a very noble gentleman from the business community named John Herford, who had done his Fulbright in, Italy, in uh, India. The second was a new member of the board named Maurizio Gianturco, who last year was awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award by this association. Uh, and those two gentlemen and I went off in many, many corners and wondered how we would do it. We weren't thinking in big terms because we didn't think we could raise a lot of money until all of a sudden John Herford said, well, he said, I could probably help with that, he said quite modestly, and he ended up endowing the prize with a sizable sum of money, uh, one digit and six zeros following it. <laughs> now, that helped a lot. That helped us get in a different ballpark, but we still needed a little bit of impetus, and that's when John Turco came in and offered the services of the Coca-Cola company, and for our first 15 years, we had a co-partner in the giving of the Fulbright Prize. Uh, and that's when it took on its, its loft in the sense that we, we were looking for heads of state, uh, people who should have been heads of state, uh, ex-heads of state, uh, you name it. Uh, it was a pretty impressive group of people. And it uh, went on. Now, at first, the selections were done by those two good gentlemen and a man who was at the time the head of the American Council of Learned Societies. We overlook that organization today, but it still has 90 or 100 of the most important 
um, NGOs, what do we say, non-governmental organizations in the various fields of the academic world. And Stanley Katz, now a professor of history emeritus at, the, uh, at Princeton University, became the first chair. And those three people worked out quite simply among them. But as the prize began to have a, a history and a, a background behind it, uh, we began to think that we'd better make that selection a little bit more, more um, universally shared and to f share it with more people. And therefore, we've built a committee which today, thanks to Manfred Phillips' wisdom uh, and uh, others, we've got it built now so that there are three foreigners on the committee. One is sitting in the room, you've just heard her name, Penny Egan. Another thought he could be with us today, Wilma James is the uh, a parliamentarian in, in South Africa and the deputy leader of the opposition. Uh, the third member is a Dr. Funubashi from Japan, who is a very distinguished journalist, Neiman Fellow, and so many other things. And on the American side, we have Nancy Neal, of course, and Manfred Phillip, and myself. And that is essentially the way the committee looked this year. Now, we like to keep the committee's names secret until it actually happens because that avoids those kinds of phone calls that you can't turn away, which says, don't you think, and so forth and so on. So that's, uh, that's a kind of protective, but it also serves a more important thing. It serves to underline the fact that the Fulbright Prize has been a prize for distinction, for great service to humanity, for service to the ideals of what Senator Fulbright tried to put in place in his program. And it has been a prize which has gone for merit only. And there was a danger, we assumed there would be sooner or later a danger that fundraising would creep, creep into the matter. There's no doubt the Ful Fulbright Association has lots of needs of fundraising. I won't deny that. But the fact was the prize was the wrong place to start. And so we began, we began working out a system to renew the, the prize every year, its selection committee, so that we had a strong representation which would ins insist on that point. And so we went through, first of all, a, 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 we called for members. Every member can, every member and anyone, in fact, can put in a nomination. We screened those down to the reasonable dozen. And then we sent them out to our selection committee in seven, five different continents and asked for their ranking order. Uh, that came back, and it was quite, quite distinction and quite distinguished. And we then began the elusive search for how we could get people to come here today. And finally, we, we finally did it. We finally got Senator Lugar, and we're all very, very proud that he's here today. We all gave a great sigh of relief because we all felt he should have gotten the prize long ago. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. Our next speaker is Mala Adiga. Let me give you a few words of introduction, Mala. Um, she oversees the Fulbright and Gilman programs. Uh, and she was, and by the way, her title I have not give, given you. She is Assistant Sec. Deputy Assistant Secretary, um, and she is in charge of those programs and many other things at state. Um, she was previously an attorney at the Department of Justice and also clerked in the Northern District of Indiana, you'll be glad to hear, for the U.S. District Court Judge Philip Simon. Um, and by the way, I hear she's a really good advocate for the Fulbright program. The word at state is, she uses the word Fulbright more than anybody else there. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Adigo will read um, a tribute to Senator Luger written by Secretary of State John Kerry. Mala.
Thank you, Ms. Neal, Senator Luger, Congressman Castro, Mrs. Fulbright, Fulbright Association representatives, and Fulbright program participants, alumni, administrators, and friends. I am delighted to join you all on behalf of the Fulbright program and the US Department of State to recognize Senator Luger as the recipient of the 2016 J. William Fulbright Prize for International Understanding. I bring greetings from Assistant Secretary for Educational and Cultural Affairs, Evan Ryan, who regrets that she cannot be with us this afternoon. My colleagues and I at the State Department are honored to serve as stewards of this remarkable program, working in collaboration with partners in the United States and around the world. The success of the Fulbright program is due to the efforts of Fulbrighters as participants and as alumni, and we thank you for all that you do. Your efforts individually and collectively to remain engaged with one another and to promote the Fulbright program are essential to its impact. And we are pleased with our strong, long-standing partnership with the Fulbright Association. Your conference theme this year, Fulbright at 70, Meeting New Challenges, invites us to think about the Fulbright program both at its origins and today. The program's enduring strength is based on three key characteristics established 70 years ago. First, the concept of mutual understanding, building relationships between the people of the United States and people of other countries. Second, the fact that the program is binational, taking into consideration mutual priorities of the United States and partner countries around the world. And third, the open merit-based selection process for participants. These principles are unchanging and contribute to the future, to the Fulbright program's ongoing strength and excellence. But at the same time, the, the program is dynamic and relevant, and it adapts to today's higher education needs and foreign policy priorities in a co complex global environment. So you all should be very proud of the Fulbright program. I wish you much success for this year's conference as you advance the efforts of the Fulbright Association. Association. Secretary of State John Kerry is a longtime supporter of the program. The secretary is traveling and not able to join us in person. However, on the occasion of his former Senate, Senator, Senate colleague and friend, Senator Luger, receiving this Fulbright Prize, the senator was pleased to offer a letter, which I would like to read to you now. Dear Fulbright Association members, I am delighted to write in tribute to the recipient of the Fulbright Association's 2016 J. William Fulbright Prize for International Understanding, my longtime friend and colleague, former Senator Richard Luger. There is no more dedicated champion of educational exchange as an element of our country's foreign relations than the Fulbright Association. Senator Fulbright established the Fulbright program in 1946 on the foundational concept of fostering mutual understanding between the people of the United States and the people of other countries in order to promote world peace. Seven decades later, with 370,000 Fulbright alumni worldwide, the Fulbright program is the cornerstone of our nation's public diplomacy efforts. Now more than ever, the efforts of people individuals and groups of citizens are essential in addressing the critical foreign policy issues of our time. From climate change, to refugees and migration, to disability rights, Fulbright scholars are central to promoting cooperation on the many challenges that face nations around the world, and they exemplify accomplishment and commitment in so many fields. As a longtime architect of our country's foreign relations, Senator Dick Luger clearly understands the unique role of the Fulbright program and of the smart power resulting from the international understanding the program fosters. In addition to his support for the Fulbright program, he was also a key sponsor of the legislation that created the Benjamin Gilman International Scholarship Program and the Kennedy Luger Youth Exchange and a Study Program. I had the enormous privilege of serving with Dick Luger for 28 years in the Senate, including our time together on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Although we had different political affiliations, Senator Luger stood for partnership and pursued a bipartisan approach to the legislative process. Whether working for nuclear disarmament in the former Soviet Union, calling for sanctions against apartheid in South Africa, or tackling global food crisis. 
Throughout his life, Senator Luger's international efforts have both enhanced our nation's place on the world stage and fostered interna international understanding between nations and peoples, epitomizing the spirit of the Fulbright Prize. Please extend my most heartfelt congratulations to my friend for this honor, which he so deeply deserves. Thanks to all of you, best wishes. Sincerely, John F. Carey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Milo. <clears throat> when our selection committee announced that Senator Luger would be the prize winner, uh, we heard immediately from the Fulbright community <laughs> that he was the perfect choice. Senator Luger, as you may know, is a former Rhodes Scholar like Senator Fulbright, who learned early in life about the importance of international understanding. He served on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee from 1976 to 2013, six years as its chair. Two things make for an outstanding prize recipient. First, he is known for a personal quality we need badly today, bipartisanship. Second, like Hans Blix, an earlier recipient, he tackled a central international issue of our time, nonproliferation. The Nunn Luger Act of 1991 led to the dismantling of 7,600 nuclear weapons in the former Soviet states. <laughs> He was also a friend to Senator Fulbright, and he remains a strong supporter of the Fulbright program. Senator Luger. I am deeply honored, deeply moved, to receive the Fulbright Prize for International Understanding. I thank the Fulbright Association and the Selection Committee for this award and for the opportunity to address this distinguished gathering of friends who are committed to the Fulbright Program. The Fulbright Prize is especially meaningful to me because of my personal experiences with Senator Fulbright. I did not have the pleasure of serving with him in the Senate. He left office in 1974, two years before I was elected to represent Indiana. But his influence on my career and development was profound and permanent. In 1954, I was fortunate to receive a Rhodes Scholarship to study at Oxford University. I chose Pembroke College, where during my first year, I was the only American. Soon after I arrived at Pembroke, my tutor in politics, the master of Pembroke, R.B. McCallum, told me about his tutorial work with Senator William Fulbright of Arkansas. Emboldened by <clears throat> Master McCallum's Fulbright stories, I decided to write to Senator Fulbright. He was in the midst of an embattled relationship with Senator Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin. <laughs> and he shared with me his thoughts about the McCarthy era in a series of letters as our correspondence expanded. <clears throat> I was deeply moved that he took the time to write to me then and during my mayoralty and Senate careers. And I'm even more astonished to learn years later that he kept all of my letters. <laughs> Senator Fulbright and I shared a remarkable number of common experiences, though generally these occurred decades apart. Both Senator Fulbright and I won Rose Scholarships after earning our bachelor's degrees. Both of us chose to study at Pembroke College. Both of us focused much attention 
on government and economics while we were at Oxford. And both of us were blessed with the same tutor, R.B. McCallum. Senator Fulbright studied under him uh, near the beginning of McCallum's career, while I was, of course, tutored much later. But both of us were elected to the Senate from our home states, Arkansas in his case, Indiana in mine, and both of these states are in the interior of the United States. And neither was typically associated with international interests a half a century ago. But both of us sought a seat on the Foreign Relations Committee right off the bat, which has oversight on U.S. foreign policy and diplomacy. <clears throat> both of us ascended to the chairmanship of the committee in due course. Senator Fulbright, of course, in fact, holds the record as the longest serving chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, a remarkable tenure from 1959 to 1974. Well, like Senator Fulbright, I discovered the extraordinary challenges and opportunities of international education at Pembroke College, my first trip outside of the United States. The parameters of my imagination expanded enormously during the time that I gained a sense of how big this world is, how many talented people there are on Earth, how many opportunities one could embrace. He was especially generous to me when I became chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in 1985 for the first time. Senator Fulbright wrote, and I quote, it's an unusual coincidence that two Rhodes men from Pembroke should be chairman of the committee, end of quote. He continued to offer encouragement during visits that we enjoyed at Senate receptions and reunions. In September 1986, I had the great pleasure to join Senator Fulbright at the University of Arkansas. And it's a great pleasure to have seen such a great delegation today from the University of Arkansas, where he had served as president for a celebration of the Fulbright Scholarship Program. Senator Fulbright is known throughout the world for the educational exchange program that bears his name. Since Senator Fulbright's legislation passed in 1946, the program has provided more than 370,000 participants the opportunity to study, teach, and conduct research in a foreign country. As Master McCallum declared in 1963, and I quote the Master, Fulbright is responsible for the greatest movement of scholars across the face of the earth since the fall of Constantinople in 1453. <laughs> that certainly sums it up. The Fulbright's program remarkable contributions to the development of hundreds of thousands of participants provide ample justification for the program. But Senator Fulbright expected much more. He was always unabashed in his advocacy of the program as a foreign policy tool. For him, the Fulbright program was not intended merely to benefit individual scholars, or more generally, to advance human knowledge, though those goals have been fulfilled beyond his original expectations, for sure. But the program was meant to expand ties between nations, improve international commerce, encourage cooperative solutions to global problems, and to prevent war. In his book, The Price of Empire, he wrote, and I quote, educational exchange is not merely one of those nice but marginal activities in which we engage in international affairs, but rather from the standpoint of future world peace and order, probably the most important and potentially rewarding of our foreign policy activities, end of quote. He called the Fulbright Scholarship Program, quote, a modest program with an immodest aim, the achievement in international affairs of a regime more civilized, rational, and humane than the empty system of power of the past. Now, for Senator Fulbright, the program was intended to give participants 
a chance to develop a sense of global service and responsibility. Alumni of the program are among the most visible leaders in their respective countries. Over the decades, they have explained to their fellow citizens why diplomacy and international cooperation are important. They have been advocates of international engagement within governments, corporations, schools, and communities that do not always recognize the urgency of solving global problems. In my judgment, the impact of the Fulbright program as a foreign policy tool has extended well beyond the accomplishments and understanding of its own participants. It has been the most influential large-scale model for promoting the concept of international education. It has been a primary validation of the American university system to the rest of the world. Now, in the United States, we have critiqued and even lamented some aspects of our public diplomacy since the end of the Cold War. But hosting foreign students has been an unqualified public diplomacy success. Nearly a million foreign students now study at United States universities, and the number is growing. The success of American universities with foreign students would not have been as profound without the stimulation of foreign interest in American higher education provided by the Fulbright program. Funding a great foreign exchange program is a sign of both national pride and national humility. Implicit in such a program is the audacious view that people from other nations see one's country and educational system as a beacon of knowledge, as a place where thousands of top international students would want to study and live. But it's also an admission that a nation does not have all the answers, that our national understanding of the world is incomplete. It's an admission that we are a part of a much larger world that has intellectual, scientific, and moral wisdom that we need to learn. In a speech on the Senate floor in 1966, during the Vietnam War, Senator Fulbright underscored his concern about our national humility by saying, and I quote, power tends to confuse itself with virtue, and a great nation is particularly susceptible to the idea that its power is a sign of God's favor, end of quote. Senator Fulbright understood that a great nation must continue to invest in its own wisdom and capabilities for human interaction. He understood that no amount of military strength or even skillful decision-making could make up for a lack of alliances, a lack of trading partners, diplomatic capabilities, and international respect. Maintaining alliances and friendships between nations is hard work. No matter how close allies become, centrifugal forces generated by basic differences in the size, location, wealth, histories, and political systems of nations tend to pull nations apart. Alliances work over long periods of time only when leaders and citizens continually reinvigorate the Union and its purposes. Often we need to pause to remember that the practice of foreign policy is not defined by a set of proposals or even a set of decisions. Unfortunately, reporters, politicians, even many historians portray foreign policy as a geological chess game or a series of great diplomatic events. This perception is reinforced by books and movies about dramatic moments in diplomatic history, like the Cuban Missile Crisis or President Nixon's going to China. Now, these events capture our imagination because we relive, we relive the struggles of leaders during times of great risk as they weigh potential consequences of their actions. We ask whether presidents and prime ministers were right or wrong in adopting a particular strategy. But Senator Fulbright understood <clears throat> that crisis decision-making is a small slice 
of the nation's foreign policy. He understood that a successful foreign policy depends much more on how well a nation prepares to avoid a crisis. When a nation gets to the point of having to make tactical decisions in time of crisis, it almost always is choosing between a bad option and a worse option. Crisis decision making is to foreign policy what a surgeon is to personal health. Whether a body will resist disease depends on good nutrition, consistent exercise, other healthy preparations, much more than the skill of a surgeon employed as a last resort after the body is broken down. The preparation for good health and for strong foreign policy is the part that we can best control. It's the part that must forever receive most of our energies and our resources. In this century, the ability of nations to communicate and work with each other across borders will determine the fate of billions of people. The effectiveness of our response to pandemics, nuclear proliferation, environmental disasters, energy, and food shortages, and threats of conflict will depend foremost on the investments we have made in knowledge, relationships, and communications. Now, since September 11, 2001, the United States has been engaged in a debate over how to apply national power and resources most effectively to achieve the maximum degree of security. Recent foreign policy discussions have often focused, unfortunately, on simplistic and demagogic policy proposals, including, for example, carpet bombing of ISIS, rolling back trade agreements, reducing commitments to allies, and building a wall on our southern border. Now, these and many other similar policy prescriptions have offered the false hope that we can solve our problems by insulating American society from the rest of the world. But to survive and prosper in this century, the United States must assign U.S. economic and diplomatic capabilities the same strategic priority that we assign to military capabilities. We must commit ourselves to the painstaking work of foreign policy day by day and year by year. We must commit ourselves to a sustained program of repairing and building alliances, expanding trade, fighting disease and hunger, pursuing resolutions to regional conflicts, fostering democracy worldwide, controlling weapons of mass destruction, and explaining ourselves to the world. As Senator Fulbright explained in a 1945 Senate speech, just before the end of the war in Europe, peace does not consist merely of a solemn declaration or a well-drafted constitution. The making of peace is a continuing process that must go on from day to day, from year to year, so long as our civilization shall last." End of quote. The success of such peacemaking will depend on our willingness to prepare for the long-term future, as, soon as, as Senator Fulbright certainly did, through enlightened investments in people and in relationships. And it will depend upon our devotion to movements exemplified by the Fulbright program that reaches out in the world with both pride and humility. I say more power to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator Luger. You've said that foreign policy is a day-to-day -day process. We're learning that mutual understanding is a day-to-day is -day process, and that's what we're trying to do in the Fulbright Association. It is my honor to present to you today the 2016 J. William Fulbright Prize for International Understanding, first 
we have a certificate, and I'll read it to you, to Richard Luger on the 70th anniversary of the Fulbright Program for sustained commitment to diplomacy and global peace through international, academic, and cultural exchange. Thank you very much. And <laughs> we're very proud to present a check for $50,000 to Senator Luger for the various initiatives he has underway for international peace and mutual understanding. Well, and also, we'd like to present to you this sculptural portrait created by Greta Bader, whose son is here today. Uh, this is a symbol of our Fulbright Prize for International Peace and Understanding. Excuse me a moment while I get my papers together here. <laughs> we have also with us today our closing speaker, and I'm very glad to introduce uh, Congressman Joaquin Castro. Uh, we asked him to come to give us some insights into how a new generation in Congress views international education <laughs> and it couldn't have been more timely, could it? <laughs> um, I met Senator, I'm sorry, Congressman Castro in Capitol Hill last spring and was struck by his dedication. He's a second generation Mexican American, born in San Antonio and graduated with, from Stanford with honors. He's represented the 20th district in Texas since 2012 and serves on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. He has pioneered the concept of the infrastructure of opportunity, and I'll let him mention that. Senator Castro. Good afternoon. It is wonderful to be with you. And it was a very easy question that was posed, so I'll give you the full answers now. Uh, thank you to Nancy for the wonderful introduction for all of your work with the Fulbright Association. Uh, to Richard Arndt, thank you for your long work also. And of course, um, Mala Adiga and everybody at the State Department for your support of this wonderful program. And most of all, to Senator Luger for your incredible commitment to this nation and to fostering understanding between the United States and nations around the world. Thank you for combating nuclear proliferation, combating apartheid, combating hunger, and for never forgetting where you came from, and always being a proud Hoosier from Indiana. <laughs> I'm honored to be here with you this afternoon and to see people who, Americans who represent every part of this wonderful nation. I represent San Antonio, Texas in the United States Congress. And I actually have a twin brother, Julian, who was mayor of San Antonio and is now Secretary of Housing and Urban Development in the President's Cabinet. And in case you get to meet my brother, even though we are twins, you'll notice that there is a very easy and clear distinction between the two of us. I'm the much better looking twin. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You know, the work of the Fulbright program has never been more necessary than today. And I got up this morning at about 3.30 in the morning in San Antonio and took a flight here and will fly back this evening to San Antonio because I wanted to be here with you and tell you how important and how critical your role is today. The work that all of you have done in fostering cultural understanding and relationships among the United States and the nations of the world 
cannot be understated at this moment. You're not only Fulbright scholars and Fulbright awardees, you are cultural ambassadors of diplomacy and cultural ambassadors of the United States. Let me tell you why I believe that is so important now. And of course, this week we have just had a big election, our presidential election, and today started to see the transition of power from one government to another. Something that of course is very special in American democracy. But let us think now about the challenges of the world over the last few years. These is, this is not an exhaustive list, but just some of the highlights of the things that we're presented with at this time. You think about the ongoing conflict between the Israelis and Palestinians in the Middle East. Think about the fact that Europe is facing its largest migration since World War II, mostly in part to the millions of Syrian refugees who have fled that nation because of war, but also refugees who have sought refuge in Europe because of other conflicts around the globe. You think about the fact that terrorism is franchised, not only in the Middle East and North Africa, but increasingly in other parts of the world. We look at what has gone on in places like Africa and the fact that groups like Boko Haram have wrought such incredible terror upon the people of some nations in Africa. You think about the Asia Pacific region. In the United States Congress, I'm honored to co-chair the US-Japan caucus, for example. You think about the tension in that region between China and Japan and South Korea and China and members of the ASEAN countries because of the militarization of islands in the South and East China Seas. Then you look at events closer to home in the United States. I come from the great state of Texas, and a few years ago and in the intervening years since, there have been tens of thousands of women and children who have come from the Northern Triangle countries of Central America fleeing intense gang violence and drug-related violence. You think about all of these challenges and the fact that when we think about the word war, war is not only a physical thing now, it is increasingly exists in the internet and in cyberspace. And we're presented with the question of how we deal with that and the appropriate responses to it. The relationship between the United States and Russia exists in a kind of no man's land sometimes between cooperation and sometimes between hostility. With all of these things that we face in the world, you can imagine that there is an incredible conversation and debate in Congress about the United States' role in the world, how we engage other nations. I suspect that coming to the next year, that conversation will only intensify. Given all of these challenges, this is not unique in history, but I sense today this temptation to recoil from the world, to recoil from our engagement with other countries, to say that the problems that we see around the globe are somebody else's problems. Sometimes to think about abandoning the infrastructure for diplomacy that we've put in after World War II. You think about all of the work that the United Nations has done, not only for the United States, but for other countries of the world in coming to peace agreements. You think about the work of the World Bank and the incredible development that it's accomplished in Latin America and Asia and Africa. We need to make sure that we preserve the infrastructure for diplomacy in the world. And I see the Fulbright program as part of that infrastructure for diplomacy. You know, during this season, there was a lot of tense conversation sometimes recriminations about different peoples. And you all have fanned out throughout the globe. You all have seen what people in Pakistan, in Mexico, in China, in Japan, in Africa, what those people are really about. You've seen them at a human level. And so when we heard some of the rhetoric about immigrants, for example, from different parts of the world, I heard I heard uh, the words that were used against Mexican immigrants, for example. And I thought about my own grandmother who came here as a six-year-old orphan around 1922. My grandmother came here because both of her parents had died around the time of the Mexican Revolution. And the closest relatives who could take in her and her younger sister were not in Mexico, but were in San Antonio. That's how my family ended up in San Antonio. 
My grandmother worked her whole life, never made it past elementary school, didn't have a formal education. So she worked as a maid and a babysitter and a cook. She worked as in the field sometimes with her families, doing everything that she could to get by. The United States for my grandmother was a beacon of hope, a place of opportunity for her. She died in 1996 when I was in my final year in college. And my grandmother, as far as I know, never owned a house. She never owned a car. She never even had a bank account. The only thing that she had at the end of her life was about a $335 a month Social Security check. And so when we think about the speci how special our country is, what it has allowed people to achieve, what makes it a magnet for people around the world, we often call it the American dream. But when we think about it, we shouldn't think about it only in monetary terms. Because if you measured it that way, there would be a lot of people, uh, our parents or our grandparents or great-grandparents, wherever they've come from throughout the world, who never achieved it. But a few years ago, my brother said something that I very much agree with. He said that in our nation, the American dream is not a sprint or a marathon, but a relay that our families don't always make it there in the span of one generation, but each generation passes on the fruits of its labor to the next. My grandmother was very proud to be able to do that. That is the story of the immigrants who have come to our country. Those are the stories that you encountered in all of your work. Those are the stories that I hope that you will continue to tell to our fellow Americans in the coming years. That is your value. You have been our ambassadors. And also tell the story of our country, that we are, of course, a proud people, that we've tried to build a nation of opportunity, that we have constructed a place that's built upon democracy and freedom and opportunity. And when I think about my grandmother and so many other people, I think about what we try to do for others around the world through that infrastructure of diplomacy, through the World Bank, for example. You know, I've often spoken about the fact that just as there's an infrastructure of roads and streets and highways that helps all of us get to where we want to go on the road, part of the beauty of this country, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because I think that it's important to remember what makes this nation great, what has made us a magnet for people around the world. This, just as there's an infrastructure of transportation, in America, there is an infrastructure of opportunity that helps people get to where they want to go in life. That infrastructure includes things like great universities and schools, a strong healthcare system, an economy that's built around well-paying jobs so that when people work hard, they can support themselves and their family members. And I realize that the challenges that other nations face are even more basic than that often. The challenges that Senator Luger talked about making sure that there's clean water, that people have something to eat so that they don't starve, that immunizations are available so that they're not taken out by disease. All of these things are things that America has helped solve around the world. All of these things are things that we should continue to support and make sure that we're committed to. We will have this conversation about engagement but engagement around the world is often discussed in terms of the use of force. When we think about being engaged and being involved in the business of other nations, we often talk about it in terms of military force. During this time, we should remember that engagement is not just about using weapons of war or the military. I was honored to serve on both the Armed Services Committee and the Foreign Affairs Committee for three and a half years. I now serve on the Foreign Affairs Committee and the Intelligence Committee. But I used to say that when I served both on the Armed Services Committee and the Foreign Affairs Committee, that those two committees taken together represent both ways that you're going to solve a conflict. And diplomacy is much more preferable to the use of force. And so we can't forget the role of diplomacy, the role of cultural ambassadors, in making sure that there's understanding among friends, because understanding between strangers is much more difficult. And so I want to say thank you for all of the work that you do. Thank you for going out to other nations and being ambassadors for the United States and showing them what we're about. 
but also thank you for coming home and talking to our neighbors and our friends about what those nations are about and helping to foster understanding here. And then I want to say this finally, as we go forward, as we think about the horizon for this country and what's at stake for all of us, I know all of us love our country very much. All of us are very proud to be Americans, very proud to be from here. And I think that we can say it without arrogance or conceit. But 50 years ago, if you asked somebody who was living somewhere abroad where on earth they would want to move if they were going to leave their home country, there's a very good chance that the answer 50 years ago was the United States of America. I hope that in all of the work that you continue to do and will do, and all of the work that we do together as Americans, that we can say 50 years from now, when you ask the same question of somebody living abroad, that the answer is still the United States of America. Thank you all for everything you do. Very best of luck.